Um, in this video, I'm going to go through OCR AS level chemistry paper, uh, paper two. Uh, and there's paper two, and this is the June 2017 paper. And it's the second half of the paper. I covered the first half in an earlier video. Okay, so the hydroxyl group is responsible for many properties of alcohols. Methanol is soluble in water because it has polar bonds. Pulling electronegative values, they give them electronegativity values, they give them here. Now it says, use a label diagram to explain why methanol is soluble in water. Okay, so this question is about the fact that methanol can form hydrogen bonds and water, the predominant intermolecular force in water, is also a hydrogen bond. And so they can hydrogen bond with each other and they can mix. Um, use displayed formulas showing one molecule of methanol, one molecule of water. Add partial charges to these to show them the two most polar bonds. So that's the OHs, yeah? Show all the lone pairs and label the most important intermolecular bond between the molecules. Okay, so, um, right. So we're gonna say, first of all, um, methanol is soluble in water because um, methanol can form H bonds and water can also form H bonds. So they can form H bonds with each other. So let's say that first of all. Right, um, why can they form H bonds? I think they've given us this, they, this, so we should, just in case this is in the mark scheme, we should make a nod to this. We should say that um, the uh, the OH bond is very polar because there's a big electronegativity difference, negativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is a lot more electronegative and hydrogen will have a partial positive charge in it. And that hydrogen, because it's it's only got one electron and it's sort of losing most of it, that's going to be that's how it can form a hydrogen. It can interact with a lone pair on another atom. Okay. Right. So let's draw our water molecule and our methanol molecule. Draw it down here. So it does say displayed formula, so I should do I'll draw methanol first of all. I'll show every bond. Right, now we have got uh, two lone pairs on the oxygen, as I said, all lone pairs. The dipole, well, we've got a partial negative charge on the oxygen, partial positive charge on the hydrogen. And this hydrogen is going to interact, I'm going to draw this as the hydrogen bond. This is attracted to a lone pair uh, on a water molecule. Oxygen always has two lone pairs and two bond pairs, so I've drawn them both there. And let's draw the partial charges on there. So delta positive, delta positive, and delta negative. Um, and label the most important intermolecular bond between the molecules. Well, it's this here, which is the hydrogen bond. That's the intermolecular force. The hydrogen bond should be quite a bit longer than the covalent bond. It's a lot weaker, so they're a lot longer. See my, the way I've drawn it there, it's a lot longer. Okay, that will be all you need for four marks there. Alcohol C is analyzed using mass spectroscopy, spe spectrometry. Give the systematic name of C. Right, so we're going to label the longest carbon chain. Uh, so that's one, two, three, four. So uh, that's going to be butan 2 O. Uh, I've labeled it one, two, three, four, rather than the other way around because that will give us the smallest number for the functional group. So the red, red numbers would be wrong. Blue numbering is correct. And we've also got a methyl group here on carbon atom number three. So it is three methyl butan 2 all. The mass spectrum of the alcohol C is, is shown below. Now that was taken out for copyright reasons. You may have seen that, so I had to get another one here. So this will look a bit different to a normal OCR mass spectrum, but it should be the same. Right, so write the structural formula of the ions responsible for peak X and Y. Now, right, let's think about our alcohol, 3 methyl butan 2 o Well, what's going to be the formula of that? It's going to be, you've got five carbons, so it's C5. You've got four in the butan and you've got one in the methyl. It's saturated, so it's going to be H12, not 2N plus 2. 
and you've got an oxygen there. So that is our molecular formula. Um, and, and the reason why I'm doing that, of course, is to see if Y is probably the molecular ion. Okay, so we've got C5H12O, right? The MR of that, if you add all that up, is 88. And Y, we can see, is at 88 there. You can just see that number there. So that, that one is quite straightforward. The, the, response, the peak responsible for Y is um, C5 H12. Okay. Now X is this big peak here, which is at 45. It's got an MZ of 45. Uh, we've got to try and see what fragment would give us a, a, an MR of 45. So if I just write down the structure, 2-methylbutanol here. two oh sorry i've got ch3 there right now i'm thinking this fragment weighs 45 i think let's just add it up so we have two carbons 24 hydrogen um, plus 16 for the oxygen takes us to 40 and then we've got four hydrogens one two three four so it is that fragment that weighs 45 um that one there weighs obviously that's going to weigh 43 so that's not right i think that's the only way you can get a fragment of 45 from that molecule right so the the um we need to write uh, the 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 one responsible for peak x then right so i'll just write that down like that put a positive charge on that carbon Sorry, this should be an OH here, not an H. Right, now it says structural formulae, doesn't it, for both ions? So really, I shouldn't just leave like that for my for why I should write down the structural formulae. I should write down, let's do it for Y. I'll just draw the structure of methyl, 2 methyl butan 2 or with a positive charge on it somewhere. So... It's got a positive charge on it, so an electron knocked off it. Okay, so that is uh, the, the structures of uh, X and Y, the one at 45. This has got an MZ of 45, um, and this has got an MZ of 88. Okay, describe the oxidation reactions of butan one all. Okay forming an aldehyde and a carboxylic acid. Explain using diagrams how an aldehyde can be produced by controlling the laboratory conditions. Well, first of all, let's see what the, oxid oxid the oxidizing agent is. Potassium dichromate solution. And it needs to be acidified with some sulfuric acid. Right. Um, that's how you oxidize it. You do need to, um, you need heat. Uh, in order for that reaction to occur. Let's write down the equations. Okay, so you've got butan 1 all So I'll write that CH3, CH2, CH2OH. We're going to oxidize it. Now, when we, in organic chemistry, when we show oxidation, we don't, uh, we just show the, oxi the oxygen from the oxidizing agent like that in a square bracket. Right, that the first step in oxidation, if we just oxidize it to an aldehyde, let's do that. So we can see there we have lost, um, I've got the formula down wrong this way, CH2OH. So you can see I've got, um, I've got 10 hydrogens there. I've only got eight hydrogens here, so I need to balance that with an H2O molecule. And then I need to balance the oxygens. Well, I have got one, two oxygens on the right and I've only got one there so it's just one oxygen in the, in the equation there. Now let's see if we oxidize it all the way to a um, carboxylic acid. You will get there.
you're going to get um, let's oxidize it all the way to carboxylic acid. So we get CH3, CH2, CH2, COH. All right. Um, on this particular one, right, we're going to get an H2O molecule here as well. And this means we've got three oxygens now. One, two, three. We've only got one there, so you would need plus two oxygens with a square bracket for that one. So there's the equations. Now it says explain how an aldehyde can be produced in the laboratory. So how do we stop the um, oxidation at the aldehyde step? Stop it here and stop it progressing to being oxidized to the carboxylic acid. Well, we do that is by distilling off the product. So we have our, here is our reaction vessel. It's a pear shaped flask, say, it doesn't really matter, a round bottom flask. And in there we've got our alcohol, butanol, and we've got the potassium dichromate and we've got acid, sulfuric acid. Uh, we're going to connect that up to a condenser. Okay, we want a thermometer in the top there. There's our condenser, and of course, it's got the jacket around the outside of it with the water to cool it down. We should put the water in at the bottom and the water comes out at the top there. Uh, we've got a thermometer. Uh, we're going to collect our aldehyde here. Okay. Now the way this works is because um, when the, when the alcohol gets oxidized to an aldehyde, the aldehyde is, is got a considerably lower boiling point than the alcohol or the carboxylic acid. Uh, so you're going to get out, al the aldehyde is going to go in there and then it will condense into a vapor. Now it's, when it condenses, it drips away. It can't go back in to the oxidizing agent into there. Okay, so that's why um, it doesn't get a chance to be oxidized the second time. So you distill off the... Um, if you want to get the aldehyde. Obviously, if you want to get the carboxylic acid, then you'd use the reef, the condenser in the reflux position. Doesn't ask you that though, so we won't mention that. Okay. Propanoic acid is a member of the homologous series of carboxylic acids. Suggested general formula. Well, let's look at propanoic acid. That has got C3H6O2. So a general formula is that N is the number of carbon atoms. Hydrogen atoms is going to be 2N and oxygen, just one or two oxygens every time. So that's the general formula. And here's the displayed formula for propanoic acid. And it's going to ask us about bond angles. Okay. So explain, state and explain the shape and bond angle around a carbon atom in the alkyl group. So it's talking about uh, one of these carbons. Well, that one or that one. Let's have a look at that. That one, I'll mark it red. Okay. What, what is the shape going to be? It's going to be tetrahedral. And the bond angle of tetrahedral is always 109.5 if you've got four bonding pairs, no lone pairs. Uh, the explanation is because you do have, we've got four bonding pairs and there are no, no lone pairs. What do those pairs of electrons do? They repel each other equally. To try and get as far away from each other as possible. And, they, and in doing so, you end up with a bond angle of 109.5. Now, the next question is going to ask us, I think, about the bond angle between, right, suggest a value for the COH bond angle. Okay, All right, let's have a look at that. And it's only one mark, so we just have to suggest, we don't have to do any explaining. But you have, right, what have you got on the COH, this bond angle here? Well, you've got two lone pairs on the oxygen. So that means that the bond angle would be 104.5, like in water, okay? That's all you need to write is the answer, but just to explain that a little bit, you've got two bond pairs and you've got two lone pairs around this oxygen, okay? And um, so the 
Yeah. You're going to end up with a, a lone pair there, a lone pair there, and a bond pair, and a bond pair. They, they will sort of be arranged tetrahedrally, those pairs of electrons, but that bond angle will not be 109.5, be a lot smaller, be 104.5, because you get more repulsion between the lone pairs and the bond pairs and a big repulsion between the two lone pairs because the difference in shape of the lone pairs, they're more kind of bulbous, they're not stretched out as much. Okay, and all, for, all you have to write down is write the number for that answer, 104.5. Okay, compound D, again, right, there's a spectra here, which was in the paper, which has been removed on their website. So I put one in, which is very similar, more or less the same. Compound D is a neutral compound, which is a structural isomer of propanoic acid. So in other words, it's got, it's C3H6O2, but it does not contain a carboxylic acid group because it, it says it's neutral. So it doesn't have that group in there. Okay, well, let's have a little think about what, before we look at the spectrum, let's just think about possibilities. Uh, it asks us to give us, suggest two structures for that. Right, so you have got C3H6O2. Right, you can tell from the carbon to hydrogen ratio that it must contain a double bond. And it can either contain a carbon-carbon double bond or it contain a carbon-oxygen double bond. Okay, now if it contains... Um, either of those, it's got oxygens, the oxygens must really form OH groups, okay? There must be an OH group there. So we, we, we've got to start thinking about looking for uh, these sort of bonds, signals of these bonds in the infrared spectrum. Okay, so the infrared spectrum, 1500, everything to the right of that, or forget about that, that's the fingerprint region, you can't interpret those peaks. Now, hopefully, you should recognize this shape over here. That, that's very characteristic of an alcohol. Um, this bit is actually the CH bonds, which we're not interested in. That doesn't really tell us anything. But this peak here is broad-ish, and it's in the right place for an alcohol OH, whereas the alcohol OH is here. They say 3,200 to 3,600. Well, that is coming in at about, that's like 3,400 there. So it's in the right place. Um, it's not a carboxylic acid. Uh, it's not, that's further to the right here. Yeah? Uh, and also it tells us the compound is neutral. It's no carboxylic acid. Now we need to look for a alkene. Potentially we might have an alkene or um, a, a carbonyl. Okay. Now the alkene, the trouble is these are very, very close together. But let's just look at this peak here is in about the right region. You can see that one there. And that is at 1567. That's about 1750 or something, that one. So it's probably a bit too high for an alkene. It is a carbonyl. Okay, that's what it is. It's definitely a carbonyl. Also, actually, the shape of that is, you probably recognize, is it doesn't look like an alkene one. They, the alkene one is much sharper and not as deep. Yeah. More like that blue thing I've drawn there. So yeah, that is, and we have got, we haven't got that. So we've got an OH and we've got um, that there. So all of our reasoning then we say, yeah, we've got an OH, an OH group, and we've got a carbonyl group. That suggests two possible structures. Well, it's only three carbons long. So there's not that many possibilities we can have there. So three carbons, let's put a carbonyl on the end and make it an, al an aldehyde. And we could have our OH there. That's one possible structure. Another possible structure, I can just move my OH along one. Put it on the end one instead. So that's two possible structures. I'll draw a third one, because there is a third one. Um, instead of a, a, an aldehyde, it could equally be a ketone. So put our carbonyl in the middle. And we just got an OH. Well, the OH can only go on the end carbon con it. So there's that's only... So it could be either of those three structures as possible for four marks. And that's it. Okay. Um, now, how about uh, this? Is about um, free radical substitution. Uh, chloropropanoic acid. So what they've done there is they've just stuck a they've swapped a, 
a hydrogen for a chlorine on the middle carbon can, so substitution can be made by reacting with propanoic acid with chlorine of free radical substitution. The conditions needed for this reaction, UV light, of course, that's what we need always in free radical substitution. Let's write an overall equation for the reaction now. So we have got uh, CH3, uh, CH2, COOH, and we're going to react that with chlorine. We're going to swap one of those hydrogens there for a chlorine. So that gives us CH3, CH, let's do that with CL there in red, and nothing's happened to the carboxylic acid. Now the hydrogen that has come off this carbon here, that ends up joining with the other chlorine to form HCl. It's not People tend to write half H2 and stuff like that. That's definitely not right. That's a very common mistake. The, the hydrogen, which gets substituted, reacts with the other chlorine to form HCl. The first step in the mechanism involves homolytic fission, right, of a chlorine molecule. Why is this step, why is it called homolytic? Right, it's because, well, here's your two chlorines with a bond there. You've got a pair of electrons in that bond. So they're chlorines. When you break it, each bond gets one electron. Homolytic means that the, the two fragments are the same. It's the same. Heterolytic, of course, you'd, you'd end up with a Cl plus and a Cl minus. That's where one of the chlorines gets both of the electrons. That doesn't happen. Homolytic, each chlorine gets one electron and you get two identical fragments. Okay, write two equations to show the propagation steps in the mechanism for this reaction. Okay, let's do that then. So we start off with, here is our, I think I'll draw this displayed as well. Okay, so we're going to have propanoic acid plus chlorine free radical that's going to take off uh, one of those hydrogens so it's going to form that hyd that carbon has had the hydrogen and its electron removed so it's got a it's not charged, but it's got a, an unpaired electron on it. And the chlorine has now formed HCl. Okay, that's the first propagation step. And the second propagation step, this free radical, I'm running out of space here. So this free radical, I'll draw it over here. That reacts with another chlorine molecule. plus Cl2, and that will form the product. So we've now got chlorine attached to the middle carbon. It's no longer a free radical. Do the chlorine in red. And it's generated another chlorine free radical. That's why it's propagation, because it leads to the production of another, another radical. Okay, that is our two propagation steps then, yeah. Right. Draw the displayed form of other radical formed in the first propagation step. Well, I've done that. That is that thing there. I've already done that. Okay. Further substitutions forms a mixture of organic products. Okay, draw the structure of an organic product formed from two chloropropanoic acid by further substitution. So all we've got to do is we just got to we can substitute any of these other hydrogens for for chlorine. Okay, so you can do anything there. So let's just say uh, any. Which I'll just draw one because there's a lot of different ones you could draw. Let's say we have now got a chlorine on that one as well on the end one, as well as the chlorine there. Okay, so that is our um, 
one possible product and you could have it you know any all of these can be replaced you could have them or just one of them or some of them whatever okay they're all acceptable okay this one now organic synthesis organic compounds can be prepared in the lab using, using synthetic roots with two or more stages a student devises a two-stage synthesis of cyclohexane from bromocyclohexane okay now how could we do that okay so i think the so if you add naoh to that what you're going to do is you are going to you're going to get nucleophilic substitution you're going to swap that bromine for an oh so um what you're going to get is uh, cyclohexanol uh, now the conditions for step two or well, what's happened in step two we have done we've removed this oh and a hydrogen from that carbon there and in doing so we formed a double bond and we've made water so it is dehydration and if you remember the conditions for dehydration, you need to heat with conch sulfuric acid. You reflux it. Conch H2SO4. Okay, uh, that's the gradient conditions. Heat with reflux, conch sulfuric acid. Now, this is going to be a percentage yield. A student carries out this synthesis and obtains 1.23 grams of pure cyclohexane from 5 grams of bromocyclohexane. Calculate the percentage yield. Okay, so let's just write down the overall equation. So we're going to get uh, bromocyclohexane goes to cyclohexene so with one mole of that gives us one mole of product let's write down the mrs of those two things that would be useful okay so the mr this one is c6 h11 br okay um, so that's an mr of 162.9 this one is c6 h not 12 but 10 Remember that yeah, you lose, well, every time you form a double bond, you lose two hydrogens. And also if it's cyclic, you lose two hydrogens. You know, when I say lose two hydrogens, you, I mean, if it's saturated, it would have, you know, if it was hexane, it would be 14 carbons. Hexene, it would be 12, but cyclohexene is 10. Yeah. Okay. And the MR of that is going to be 82. All right. So, now let's we let's we start off with 5.5 grams of bromocyclohexane. Let's work out how many moles we've got. So moles of that mass over MR 5.5 over 162.9. That gives us 0 0.0337 moles. Now, one mole of, of this gives us one mole of the product. So the number of moles of cyclohexene we should get is the same. Like that here. So moles point zero three three seven, And so the mass of cyclohexene for 100% yield is equal to moles times MR. Uh, the moles is 0.37337. The MR is 82. That should give us 100% yield um, of 2.76 grams. Right, but you get 1.23 grams. That's all you get. So percentage yield then is going to be the ex is the actual amount you get 1.23 grams divided by the expected 2.76 multiplied by 100 which gives us 44.5 
percent. I'm giving it to three significant figures because all our data is given to three significant figures. So our answer should be given to that as well. Okay. Okay, cyclohexene is reacted with bromine to prepare the organic compound F. Give the structure of F and outline the mechanism for the reaction. So let's think what kind of reaction are we going to get here? So we've got our cyclohexene and here's our BR2. Now, BR2, you remember you get an electrophilic addition reaction. Now, there's no permanent dipole on this bromine molecule but you get an induced dipole that will be delta positive and that'll be delta negative. The reason is the nearest bromine is nearest to this double bond, which has got high electron density. So that pushes the electrons in the molecule down to the right hand side, makes the left hand bromine slightly partially positive. Now uh, we'll do this to the curly arrows. Uh, the pi electrons jump from the pi bond onto the bromine and form a, a bond there. And that means this pair of electrons has got to break away uh, and, and bro the other bromine takes them. Right, so the intermediate is going to look like this. The bromine is now forming a bond to that carbon. Uh, this carbon has uh, is got a positive charge in it. That's a carbocation. And we've got a Br- minus ion from the splitting of the of the bromine molecule, All right? That's got three lone, four lone pairs in it. I'll just draw one, and that lone pair is going to go from there onto the carbon with a positive charge, and it will give us the product. That is it. Now I think that is the last question in the paper. I believe, yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat>